Hello, everyone. I'm Jerry DiPiano. I'm the Chief Executive Officer of Fem Pharma Consumer Healthcare. Welcome to our webinar. Fem Pharma Consumer Healthcare is on a mission to deliver the difference in products and services for women entering or experiencing menopausal symptoms. We hope that you find this video webinar informative and also a lot of fun. We have great panelists that are going to be sharing with you some of the ways in which they address some of the menopausal symptoms you've obviously confronted either on your own or through your healthcare practitioner. So welcome our moderator, Nancy Fallon. And before you leave, check out our website, www.fempharma.com to learn about our exquisite products Thank you so much, Jerry. Uh, you are a terrific CEO and uh, co and founder of Fem Pharma, and delighted to be here today. We are going to have a great conversation about the vaginal and vulvar problems and how to optimize your telemedicine consultation because that is something that we are all using uh, with a lot more frequency. So we're going to get started today by uh, doing a quick round of introductions. I'm going to ask each of our um, outstanding panelists to give an introduction of, say, who they are, what their uh, area of expertise is, where they practice, and something that they've started doing as a result of uh, quarantining and uh, social distancing. So I'm going to ask uh, if uh, Dr. Debbie Saltman could uh, go first, and then we're going to work our way around the panelists. Hi, uh, thanks for that. Uh, it's really good to meet all our friends again from the Scientific Advisory Council from Fem Pharma and to welcome all the people online to our first webinar and we hope the first of a series of webinars. Uh, my name's Deborah Saltman. I'm the Medical Director for Fem Pharma and I'm a family physician uh, originally from Australia via England and now living in Philadelphia and I've been working with Jerry for some time uh, on the products that I really have a great faith and believe in. Um, I've written several books on women's health. I have a commitment to women's health. I've worked in and out of the industry. I've been a clinician. And now I've found that the really important work that's being done in women's health is being done not in the settings of the clinical practices and prescribing, but the new arenas like over-the-counter and non-prescription kind of medicine. The other thing that's pretty important is this avenue to talk with clinicians, healthcare providers, and patients about things that are important for us as we experience them, and particularly in these difficult and try trying times. So thank you, Nancy. Glad to be here, glad to see my friends again, and hope you enjoy chatting with us. Terrific. Dr. Sabita Pillai. Hi, um, I'm Sabita Pillai Friedman, and I'm a sex therapist. I am also an associate professor at the Center for Human Sexuality Studies at Widener University where I train um, students in the master's program and the PhD programs in uh, sex therapy and sex education. And I have a private practice uh, where I see um, couples and individuals who are dealing with sexual health issues and sexual difficulties, so I do sex therapy. I've been a sex therapist for 25 years and I'm really uh, committed to helping people who are affected by cancer and I um, provide sexual health information to cancer survivors and cancer groups, survivorship groups. Um, what have I started since the epidemic started? Um, I have started a roof garden. I live in the city and I live in a vertical house and have a, a roof uh, garden. So I have been um, spending a lot of time on it and it, it, I wake up with a lot of excitement to see my roof garden. Oh, that's lovely. Oh, terrific. Thank you for sharing that and joining us today. Dr. Catherine Shreve. Hi, thank you for joining us this evening. Um, I'm an internist at Thomas Jefferson University, and I founded a Center for Women's Health 25 years ago um, with the belief that just because we trained in internal medicine doesn't mean that we shouldn't understand um, uh, the reproductive health of women, and they're not mutually exclusive. Um, and um, I have a, a lot of interest in hormones. Um, uh, in the 90s, I studied how sex hormones affect high blood pressure and um, cholesterol levels. 
um, and I wrote a, a handbook for physicians on how to prescribe hormone replacement therapy. Um, and I'm also very interested in, in um, the role of omega-3 fatty acids in preventing disease and, um, and vitamin D. And something I've started uh, doing since the um, uh, pandemic began, um, well, I didn't start a garden like Dr. Palai, um, I started putting gel in my hair. Uh, not to be too shallow, but what I discovered by putting gel in my hair is that it's actually not straight. I actually have ringlets and I'm trying to embrace them. Oh, they look beautiful. Wonderful. <laughs> We've oh, got that's a great. lot of curly hair here today. <laughs> great, Dr. Dana Shannis, go ahead. Hi, so I'm Dana Shannis. I'm a board certified OBGYN and I'm an author with the National Institutes of Health. About a year ago, I started a, a, a private practice right outside Philadelphia that specializes in pelvic pain, sexual health, menopause, and cancer survivor care. Um, I have a passion in this, and this is, uh, you know, I'm so excited to be here to discuss with these great panelists. Um, one thing that I have uh, kind of perfected over um, quarantine is building Lego sculptures. So uh, my husband has always loved Legos, and I built him, I'll show you a picture, a desk out of thousands of Legos. Oh, wow. I wow. hot glued them. Very impressive. Um, it took a very long time, um, but it was a lot of fun. That is an overachiever. Yeah, that's impressive. <laughs> I know. That's, I hope he appreciates you. That he is really uh, done. Yes. He okay. Really Good does. to know. Good to know. <laughs> so, so on that note, uh, Dr. Dana, we're going to get started with you. So we're here to talk about how to optimize your telemedicine consultation and remote engagement. So what are your, your best practices for how to have a really great conversation, even about a more intimate topic like vaginal and vulvar uh, issues that a woman may be facing? Yeah, so I think there are a lot of things that you can do pr to prepare ahead of time to really make sure that the, the visit goes um, as optimally as possible. So I think the, the first thing that's um, valuable is scheduling. Uh, so I've tried to expand my hours um, and include some evenings and try to be a little bit flexible because basically if a patient is distracted, then that's not going to be as meaningful of a, a visit. So I ask a patient when scheduling, is there a chunk of time where they won't be responsible for watching the kids, for cooking, anything, where they can really just separate themselves and focus on the conversation? And occasionally that is at eight o'clock at night. And, um, and so I try to be able to be accommodate that a little bit. Um, so that we can get that, that time of uninterrupted attention. Um, I also advise them to prepare their location they're going to be, make sure they're in the spot with good Wi-Fi, and I try to do that myself as well. Um, I prop up, um, their, I recommend they prop up and I do the same to, um, so you're not holding your phone or video device, so you're not worrying about if it's a good angle, if you're, if you're looking good, you can really have it more be conversa conversational. Along those lines, I also ask them ahead of time um, to examine themselves. And um, if there's any discolorations, anything, they can take pictures and send it to me ahead of time. Um, I know that there are some providers who do exams via telemedicine. I find that very, very difficult to really get a good view. Um, so I often tell the patients ahead of time to take a look and you can send me pictures or any records or things ahead of time so that we're not trying to, to get that during the visit. Um, I also have them plan for what happens if we get disconnected. So what, you know, if, if there's a bad connection, often they'll try to call back or I'll try to call them and it's busy. And so by planning ahead of time saying, if, we, if I can't hear you, I'm going to send you another link. If that doesn't work, then I'm going to call you on the phone or setting up a plan so that it's not trying to figure it out if that happens, which inevitably, no matter how well you try to prepare, sometimes the, the Wi-Fi just goes out. Um, I like to go over the expectations ahead of time um, so that they know what to expect. It feels a little bit different than an in-person visit. So um, kind of addressing that you might feel a little awkward or, you know, that it's going to be a little bit different sometimes eases that tension. Um, 
And then I also tell them that with telemedicine visits, I usually have them follow up more frequently. So do not fret if at the end of it, you feel like you didn't quite have a handle on everything. Um, we'll talk again soon and reinforce what, what questions there still might be. Um, one other thing that I like to do, and I recommend that the patients can actually uh, offer this up themselves, is um, a code word or something to do if somebody walks in. Since we're talking about such personal topics, um, they might have a partner walk in and, and be in the middle of saying something that they really don't want them to hear and it's very awkward. So um, I often ask my patients, is there a topic that you want to say or a word you want to say, like rooftop gardening, um, which I want to hear more about later, by the way. But, um, but that way, we already have something. They don't have to feel awkward. They can say, oh, I started doing this, and I know that that's because somebody's there, and I can allow them to let me know when they're safe to, to return to the private topic. Some great tips, some great tips. Anybody, any other panelists want to add some additional perspective with the, the time that we have uh, recently all been doing telemedicine? Uh, sure. I, I really, Dana, I really appreciate you saying that um, it's important to, um, you know, s uh, tell them ahead of time, you're go we're going to be talking about some awkward things and be prepared for it. I love that. I, I think it's a great idea. Catherine, anything you want to add? Yeah, uh, that was a wonderful, exhaustive list. Uh, talk about patient-centered. That is patient-centered. It's wonderful. Um, so um, one thing, uh, maybe you mentioned this, um, I asked patients to make a list of the symptoms that are bothering them because since we're having an artificial conversation, we're not used to this yet. Um, they may forget things, they may feel self-conscious, and as you said, they um, may be looking at themselves. And um, so I want them uh, to write down what their concerns are and um, so we can address them. And uh, often our, our platform uh, just doesn't work. And so I'll say um, we may um, uh, get disconnected or you may freeze, and if that happens, here's the next thing we're going to do and just give them a plan so they can relax. Oh, terrific. Great. Thanks, Dr. Dr. Deb. So uh, one of the other issues is the delay of this format. As good as Zoom or Skype or Microsoft is, there is still that delay of the urgency. And as clinicians, we don't do very well with it. And in fact, most of us interrupt patients within seven seconds of silence. So really, and we're used to doing that. So sometimes I just have to sit on my hands and count and realize that the facial response or the response I get is not directly related to what I've said just then. So there's importance of kind of pauses and taking the time to understand that this is a different, it's a bit more static, it's not so interactive. Um, I had a comedian talk on the radio about how hard it is to form groups to make comedy together because they don't get the interaction. As much as we all know each other and interact, it's still tricky. So one of the things I find really hard is explaining to patients that it's not just that I'm listening, it's not just that I'm trying to answer their questions, but we need the space to understand the environment in which we're operating. Yeah, that's a really good insight, really good insight. Yes, because we, we, we don't have all of our senses because it's virtual that, that help feed information. So we need to give ourselves a little bit of time to process that. So continuing along those lines, uh, Dr. Sabita, so we're, we're in quarantine and that may limit some of the, the treatment options that you may have available for, for your, your uh, patients. So um, how do you approach and what are your treatment you know, approaches to women that are menopausal given the limitations of social distancing? And, and you know, what do you recommend? How are you approaching that? Well, as a sex therapist, I do not examine patients. I just provide sexual health information. I do therapy. So most of what I do can be done through telemedicine to telehealth. So I'm realizing that and I'm realizing, hmm, maybe this would be a good option for me just to continue on and not to even rent a space in Center City. It's prohibitive. Um, so I would say that first and foremost, even for all mental health professionals and healthcare professionals, I'm including doctors and nurses and you know, healthcare professionals in general, we can first and foremost initiate conversations about sexuality, which very few 
healthcare providers do comfortably. So by us initiating the conversation, we are giving them permission to talk about sex. So I think just doing that would be very, very useful. Asking a woman who's going through menopause, how is your sex life? Can open the door and with great relief, they may share a lot of things they wouldn't otherwise share. So I think that can be done through telemedicine, whether you're a sex therapist or a physician or a nurse practitioner, you can easily do this. I also feel that you can do history taking very comfortably through telemedicine. Um, and another thing you could do comfortably through telemedicine is um, uh, provide them, you know, ask for symptoms and information about symptoms, what is going on, and providing them education about those symptoms. You know, if, if I have a sexual pain, I may think this is the end of the world. So if someone who's menopausal comes in with pain, it, you know, it's very important for us to explain to them, this is a very common symptom for people going through menopause because you know, there is a possibility that you're suffering from vaginal dryness, which is related to uh, the decline in estrogen levels in your body. So normalizing the symptoms that they come in and they have been holding on to because they're afraid to ask physicians about it, normalizing it is also something we can do very easily through telehealth. And also, I would also say providing them with um, specific suggestions. Well, if you're suffering from sexual pain, have you considered uh, using lubricants? What sort of um, vaginal moisturizers do you use? You know the difference between moisturizers and lubricant. This is the difference between moisturizers and lubricant. Now, uh, tell me what you can do, what else you have been doing to deal with the pain. Uh, and if they're talking about uh, de desire disorders, giving them suggestions, you know, what do you, do you still uh, self-pleasure? Do you masturbate? And do you fantasize? Um, tell me more about the arousal issues. You're not, you're not feeling aroused when you are touched. So those sorts of information you can easily gather. And you can also, as you're gathering information, provide them with reassurance that, and provide them with hope. So all of these we could do through telehealth. It's very easy to do. I'm hearing that you're not seeing uh, constraints from uh, from telehealth, which is which is terrific, and that you're finding that you're able to provide some some really meaningful treatment options um, to your patients. And it sounds like uh, you know pay treatments that you can um, access, that you can help them understand the different types of solutions, and maybe even treatments that arrive on their door so they don't have to leave their house are, are really Absolutely. good options. Any other of our experts want to provide uh, perspectives on, uh, on the same topic? Sure. So I think that telemedicine has really helped in um, spending the time to go over some other lifestyle changes. So I completely agree that going over the counsel counseling and normalizing and, and going over the differences between these um, and over-the-counter products are really, really helpful. There are also a lot of lifestyle changes in diet, exercise, mindfulness, breathing, um, other things that have no harm um, and have a benefit even beyond just menopausal symptoms and sexual health. So I find that um, being, having the time to focus on that a little bit more um, because we're not doing an exam, we're not necessarily rushing to a prescription medication, um, although I don't always rush to a medication in person either, but um, I think that really um, has been helpful through the telemedicine platform. And those things really improve quality of life greatly. Um, so I, I think that is a valuable um, thing that is easily done via telemedicine. That's great, terrific. Dr. Catherine, I, th I want to I want to continue that that uh, line of thought. So there isn't a person I've spoken to that hasn't uh, self-identified as gaining, you know, two to five pounds in the quarantine or having some other health and wellness uh, issues. And so, you know, I'd like to understand how are you supporting women through the use of telemedicine in their in achieving their overall health and wellness goals, especially in light of the pandemic. And when they're going through menopause, how do you take that whole approach to, to your treating your patients and helping them? I think it's natural to eat out of anxiety and it's natural to go to foods that um, 
uh, your go-to when you're stressed, whatever kind of carb. Uh, I certainly uh, have noticed that patients are drinking a lot more alcohol, or at least they were in March and April. Um, so uh, in my practice, we have a rule, no blame, no shame. And um, we acknowledge what happens. I mean, I myself ate a lot of marshmallow peeps in uh, March. <laughs> it wasn't pretty. And um, we acknowledge it and we say, this is, this is what we do. And we're not going to fixate it. We're not going to fixate on the number on the scale. We are going to get back on the wagon and do what we've talked about, uh, the big three, which is nutrition, exercise, or physical activity, and sleep. All the self-care things that all of us need. Um, so uh, I emphasize the positive and don't shame anyone. Um, if it comes to uh, menopausal symptoms, um, people, one thing I noticed is that they haven't been, if they haven't been at work, at least for the two months, um, and they haven't been distracted by work, they may notice their menopausal symptoms more and are more likely to talk about those symptoms. And what I tell people is that you, you know, you wonder if your cognition is related to menopause or not. Um, doctors have told you that you're just getting older and you're stressed and tired, but your cognition is related to menopause because the sex hormones, we produce estrogen and estrogen goes right to our brain and that's what makes us smart, right? It's a, it's a great a, a great perspective. I love it. And I, I, I think I ate a few peeps as well. I, I'm a, a fan of the yellow ones. I have to self-identify. It's my, my favorite flavor. So it's interesting you talk about that. You talk about how um, some of some women may be more aware of their, their menopausal symptoms um, in light of the pandemic. And so I'm curious, you know, for, for other panelists or, or for you, Dr. Catherine, you know, how do you, um, how do you approach topics that maybe people are living with um, every day that are not urgent, like, you know, I broke my leg and I have to fix it now, but they can be serious and impact their quality of life, like the symptoms associated with menopause and even things like, you know, some of the associated things um, in terms of cognition. How do, you, how do you approach that so that you have that as part of, you know, today's the day we're going to do something about it? Right. So I ask patients questions and the fact that I ask the question means it's safe and I'm interested and I'm here, I'm present. Uh, for example, um, in their late 30s, women may get palpitations um, and early 40s that are related to uh, changes in the hormones, um, maybe from uh, progesterone really going down much faster than estradiol does. And um, it's amazing what women will, will just suck up and deal with because, <laughs> because they're tough. Women are tough. The number of women who walk around um, in diapers who never told me until I asked, or worse, stool incontinence, and they think, well, you know, I just got to deal with it. I'm not saying that's due to menopause. What I'm saying is, they, as you alluded to, they may not take their menopausal symptoms very seriously because it's like a nuisance and something they just live with. And um, if your vagina hurts, if sex is very uncomfortable, if you don't have a libido, oh well, right? And um, so I, you know, gently ask one question after another, and then we pursue them. You know, just related to that, I also want to acknowledge here that couples are living under uh, extraordinary conditions. You know, staying in the same house with the with, with their partner day in and day out, looking at them in their sweatpants and their sweaty clothes day in <laughs> and day out doesn't really allow them to be sexual at night. So I, sometimes I even have to get to the nitty gritty and tell people, uh, you know, can you, you know, don't stay in your pajamas all day. Can you just change your clothes? Can you dress up a little bit? Uh, you know, can you put on a perf little bit of perfume and pretend like you're going to work um, just so you can, you know, uh, attract each other. So I work with couples all the time. And so I had to like, talk to them about the, you know, important things like, you know, personal hygiene, uh, you know, in the presence of each other and, you know, not really staying on top of each other. Can you maybe go to another room and do your work and come back? 
So I find that, you know, this is a very unusual time for couples. I'm seeing a lot, a lot of that in my practice. Yeah. Dr. Deb. Can you? You're muted. Deb, you're mute, muted. I know, thank you. Uh, so I love to hear my own voice, but often it's quite too much for everyone else. But, you know, much as I love to talk about sex, and I agree with you, sex, sometimes it's not just about sex. I mean, the whole issue, I mean, I think Catherine brought the issue up before, is somehow we as women think when our pubic hair starts, it's about having babies and the things that make babies. And quite often in the menopause, the thing that women want to talk about is, I've just rediscovered, I've got a front funny and a back funny or a fanny or whatever, a perineum or a vulva or, or a vagina. I've got this region and I've never thought about it. And all of a sudden it's telling me, hey, I've got to do something down here. Something's happening here. I haven't thought about it before, but now I've got to think about it. Now, kind of, I'm an old feminist and I used to read Our Bodies Ourselves and had the little mirror out and had a look. But a lot of patients today and you know, young people say, ooh, I don't want to look down there. And I find it really fascinating. I mean, when, we were, when we were having our periods, we bleed every month. And as we bleed every month, um, we, we, we see blood. But young kids don't like the sight of blood. Young girls don't like the sight of blood, yet we bleed every month. And it's the same kind of thing about as we go through the menopause, particularly as the age and our vagina might get tighter and thinner and hard to work with, not only in sex, but in the daily living. We need to have a think about what we're going to do down there. So I try to get the women to come, you know, come into the bathroom with me. Come on, because no one goes into the bathroom with us anymore. I go into the bathroom. When I used to do house calls, it was the first place I'd go. I'd say, look, I have to wash my hands. Not before COVID, because I wanted to check what was in the medicine cabinet. Because, you know, 60% of what people have in their medicine cabinet is over the counter. It's bought without even telling the doctor about it, you know. And a lot of it's out of date. So come, come to the bathroom with me. Lock the door. Let someone else look after the kids. Or if you haven't got kids, your dogs, your cats, whatever it is, your neighbours. Come to the bathroom and let's have a look at each other. You have a look at yourself. And I want, you can't see me below the waist. And I can't see you. But let's have a look. Tell me what you see, touch and feel and tell me what you feel. And that way there's a kind of connection and the bathroom is private. There's a kind of connection between us. And I say, are you feeling pain? Are you feeling discomfort? Have you felt that area before? Explain what you feel. Only today I was talking with a lady about what was happening in her vulva and whether she felt it and what she would talk with her doctor about. So it's about touchy-feely and, and not touchy-feely in the sense of emotional connection, but against if we can't be physical. Sometimes I even hold my hand out just to say, here's my hand. Touch your hand as if it's mine. So making that kind of connection. So I've got them in the, in the bathroom and I'm saying, did you put some moisturizer on your face or on your face today? And they say, yes. Oh, did you? That's really good. You know, maybe they haven't done enough. But, and did you moisturize that dry spot on your elbow? You know, the bit that always comes to you? Well, what about below your hairline? <laughs> and what's happened now that you can't get your Brazilian or you can't even get the bikini ready for going to the beach because you can't go to the beauty parlor? So what are you thinking down there? What are you thinking about your front fan? And how do we deal with it? And do you moisturize it? Because it's pretty important. And now for me, it starts from the face and it goes all the way down my body. I don't use the same thing all the time. Because I find that the skin moisturizers on the legs and arms just don't work for the mucosal kind of areas like my vulva and my vagina. But I still use some So it's really important to let women have the opportunity to say, this is a private space. We don't have a consultation, but in the house, the bathroom can be your private space. And if you want to talk to me there, I'm very happy to go into your bathroom with you. That's terrific. Yeah, go ahead, Kath, Dr. Catherine. Yeah, that's wonderfully empowering. Definitely our bodies, ourselves, very cool. Um, one of the things we do is um, we ask a woman or um, teenager if they want a mirror so they can see during the pelvic exam what we are doing. And um, teenagers, young women invariably say no, but women of a certain age will say yes. and one of my favorite things is like what Deb is talking about, which is demystifying uh, down there and um, showing, uh, you know, I um, showing them the vulva, what's what, 
And for many women, especially church women, um, who are very conservative, the ones who wear hats, the ones who won't wear pants, um, in, in their 60s and 70s, they are fascinated. They have no idea what it looked like and what goes where. And I say, you know, um, you see how it's smooth here. So that means that you have less estrogen and maybe this is why you're uncomfortable or you feel there's something wrong with your underpants and, um, and so on. I have a vulva puppet in my office that I use. Um, and it's, uh, you know, I can use it now, but um, you know, I have a vulva puppet and I hand it to them and I say, tell me, where does it hurt? you know and so it's really oh. wonderful it, there's oh, actually a company that makes vulva puppet <laughs> and they, they'll make it the color you want i want one mine so, is purple so one of the things, <laughs> nancy one of the things that one. brought me to fem pharma was <laughs> i spent my whole life trying to wade through the evidence about hormone replacement therapy and estrogen creams and whether you should use them or shouldn't use them and i have to tell you the biggest the two biggest <laughs> debating groups are two sworn enemies from Australia, Graham Coldix and Valerie Burrell, who did the two biggest studies, who found both exactly the opposite finding and have changed their minds at least six times in the evolution of the HRT debate. And so I can see why women are worried and thinking, hey, I, should, I don't want to use HRT. I'm confused. It's a bit like the COVID confusion that we've got now. Right. And so for me, it was pretty important to try to work with something that wasn't hormonal. Also for women who kind of, don't have issues that are directly hormonal, like Sjogren's, like lichen planus, some of the autoimmune diseases, thyroid. People with those kind of conditions, you know, estrogen may or may not help them. So it was important to find something. And, and, and you know, the old, beautiful hyaluronic acid, particularly when it's nice and viscous, is fabulous. People ask me if it's natural. I said, no, it's nat not natural, but it's in my body. I'm not going to melt down people, is it? That you know, there's a book called Perfume where he melts down people. I don't want bodies melt down to get hyaluronic acid, but it is a natural product that we have in our bodies. We just don't have enough. So I tell people, hey, how about starting with something natural? And then they come back after 10 days and say, sorry, not much changed. Well, I say, how long have you had it for? You have you had it for 10 days? So if you haven't had it for 10 days, how come you expect it's going to get better in 10 days? So, you know, the price of liberty is eternal vigilance. You know, anything you use, you have to use for quite a period of time. And I always say it's a factor of five. If you think of five minutes, five hours, you know, it, you're moving the time frame. So if someone's had this problem for five years, it's not going to go away in five minutes. And we know that now from lots of conditions. I mean, and, and whether it's sexual health, whether it's gynecological health, whether it's incontinence, whether it's mental health, all these particular things, they take time. And as we get older, they take longer. And so the persistence is the most important thing I tell women. You've got to keep on going. You've got to be robust. We've got busts. We should be robust and keep on going forward and keep on continuing to use products until we get a resolution and not expect a fix, quick fix on any level. So that's the other message. And, and, and particularly now, that's kind of important when lots of women have had things done to their vulvas and their vaginas like rejuvenation or, you know, had some lichen planus taken off with laser and they can't have that stuff right now. They're in this kind of hiatus between when's my next treatment coming up, if that's the kind of treatment I want, or vaginal dilatation or implants, all that stuff. They've got to be thinking, what can I do at home? What's home delivery? And I call it home delivery. And I think clinicians, as part of clinicians, we can be part of home delivery. We can help them with their home delivery. And it's not always in the ways we did it before, just like like, you know, Sabita and Dana and, and Catherine have been saying, it's not always in the same way, but it doesn't mean it's any worse. In fact, it may be better that we have the, the uh, for being fortunate to be in each other's homes and sharing a home space and that safe space to talk about these things. That's so well said. Dr. Dana. So uh, that, that was great. Um, and, and I think that um, one thing that really helps with patients feeling comfortable in giving these um, over-the-counter options a really good chance is that you've already asked the questions, you've validated their concerns. And one thing that I like to add is I give them kind of a future plan. So 
you know, yes, you have to give this a try and it may take some time, um, but we have these other things that you can add on, these other things that we can do. So you don't have to lose hope. Um, and I find that when I put it in part of the treatment plan as um, kind of the first step we're gonna do is use this moisturizer. Um, they don't look at it so much as an over-the-counter, they look at it as a prescription I'm telling them to do that they don't need a prescription for. And I think that really changes kind of their expectation of it working. And um, as I think we all know, the placebo effect is huge. Um, and I think in sexual health, it's, it's even more profound. So them believing that this over, that I'm not just saying, okay, go to your store and just go pick something. If I say the first step is to try a moisturizer with this, these ingredients and give it this chance, and then we're gonna reassess in four weeks and move on to whatever it may be, um, it becomes part of the treatment plan, um, not just I'm gonna try some random thing I saw online. And I think that's helpful in them continuing the treatment and believing that it'll work. I think you're brave at four weeks, Dana. I, you know, I, I, I try to say, look, give it three to six months. If you've had this for years, even four weeks, you're pushing me. I'm a physician, but you're pushing me. Don't push me. I can't be pushed that hard because I can't. So one thing on sexual health. I've found in sexual health is that um, whether they need it or not, a lot of patients really prefer having more frequent follow-up with me. And I tell patients, you can cancel an appointment if you are able to just keep with the first treatment plan and there's nothing I need to follow up on health-wise, we're just going, I tell them they can cancel and they often don't. They often just want to, I don't know if they want to see my face. I used to hug the patients. Maybe they just wanted a Dana hug. I don't know what it was, but there's something that, that I've been told is reassuring about the frequent follow-up. Um, and I think when we're all really eager for human interaction, I think on telemedicine, I rarely have a patient say, no, why don't I wait longer to talk to you? So it's not that I say in four weeks, okay, you gave that a try, that's over, there's nothing else. But I, I try to let them know that they're not abandoned. They're not going to go six months feeling you know, hopeless that it didn't work and that there's nothing else you know, that, that I can do or that I don't care. Um, but, but by checking in at certain points, I think it keeps the hope alive. Yeah, brilliant point, brilliant point. <laughs> so, um, you know, I was surprised when I uh, switched to telemedicine, how many people wanted to, you know, come and see me. I thought I, my practice would be done and I would have the summer off to focus on my roof garden. But no, I, all my clients stayed and they see me on a weekly basis and we do a treatment plan and I coach, I, you know, in addition to being, doing therapy, I also coach them. I also say, what is your goal? Okay, these are the things we are dealing with right now. So I, every time I finish my session with a list of homework that they have to do when they come and see me next week, the following week. So um, this way I get them, they feel like they're doing something towards the uh, you know, goal um, and I keep them on it. It sounds to me like in a lot of cases that, that telemedicine is actually helping to foster really strong communication and relationships. And because it, it, doesn't, it, it doesn't allow as much from a clinical perspective. And so you've got to get creative and the, the asking questions, setting expectations, having the follow-up, getting the plans and the communication is really supportive of, of helping people achieve their goals, which is if, if anybody disagrees with that, but that's what I'm taking away from the, the conversation as, as some, some great lessons learned, which is, uh, which is terrific. So I'm getting, um, I'd, like to, I'd like to ask a question um, that I'm, I'm getting a question that's coming in and they're looking for some guidance on what are some resources that can help with, uh, with plans of care. And as you're doing that, know that our next question is gonna be around, you know, um, what are you know, the, the last thoughts that you wanna share with, the, with our viewers? So what are some resources that you use or that you'd recommend for developing these treatment plans? So there are a couple organizations that I find helpful that um, put out good recommendations. I think that Ishwish um, has, is good for a lot of the sexual function. 
Um, there's the National Menopause Society also puts out um, uh, recommendations. Um, one resource that I use that won't be helpful for many others is my mom is an endocrinologist who deals with hormone replacement therapy. So we debate all of the, the new studies and, and, and everything that comes out. Um, so I, as a researcher at heart, I, I often just go back to the data and then try to synthesize that into what recommendations um, that, that these other organizations give. But those are two of the um, organizations that I think do a pretty good job. Thank you. Oh, well, uh, I can also I can also add ASEC to it, American Association of Sex Educators, um, Counselors and Therapists. Uh, they put out a lot of information. They have a referral list. So I think that's a great resource. And there is a woman called Joan Price who has a lot of resources for menopausal women. She just came up with a, a new uh, erotic film for um, you know, older folks. And I think that is, uh, you know, I use resources like that within the ASEC community, people who are doing work with, um, you know, uh, menopausal uh, individuals. Can't hear you. Can't hear you. <laughs> I know, loud voice. We've got quite a bit on our site in Fem Pharma in the HCP section, resources, particularly about the issue of vulvovaginal health, which that isn't very well covered elsewhere. There's a lot of things that's covered about treatments, but the actual what to do in terms of vulvovaginal health. And we've got some things that we call quite interesting, we call them juries, where we review the re most recent evidence and say, is there unanimous evidence to do this? Is there a hung jury? Uh, and is there no evidence? And that's quite good to use with patients when you're talking, having a collaborative plan. You say, well, look, this is where we know things are happening. This is where we're not sure about it. And this is where we've got no knowledge at all. Where do you position yourself when we talk about things like bladder problems, vulvovaginal dryness? So there's some resources there as well. And, and certainly uh, if you send some, a message to support, we'll direct you to that stuff. We've got particularly about that. One of the issues that I think is pretty important for patients and we haven't talked about yet, and we're nearly up to an hour, so it's probably important for people with overactive bladder, is toilet paper. I'm on a mission. Toilet paper is pretty tricky when you have vulvovaginal issues. If it's too tough, it scratches and you're in problems. And if it's too soft, it forms little balls that don't go away and can irritate. And so I'm on a mission to get women to think about their toilet paper, not because of COVID and they can't get their supplies, but some of the supplies now aren't helpful. And I wish this country had invested like Europe has in bidets. A little bit of a wash, and today I suggested even a turkey baster or something, not to make babies, but to, to wash after you go to the bathroom with a pat dry with a towel rather than rubbing it with that kind of recycled toilet paper that eco makes you feel fine, but makes you feel awkward down below. So there are other things that uh, you can think about in terms of getting your patients to talk about the plan. The plan, I think we were all quiet in the beginning because I think all of us know how to create a plan. It's what you put into the particular things that are important put into the plan. And I think after this, maybe that's one of the things we might do when we talk next time about what key things, like in a recipe, like we might make a vulva vaginal sexual health plan for you at the next webinar and put the things that we think are important ingredients in. I think that's terrific. And if you didn't catch it, uh, please go to uh, www.femmepharma.com -E and look up under the HCP resources. Uh, terrific.